You've hit play on The Screen Companion, a show about helping you to decide what to watch tonight. We are talking about Dead Like Me from 2003. I am a fan of the creator of the show, Brian Fuller. He's created or co-created a half dozen shows, including Pushing Daisies, Hannibal, and the adaptation for Neil Gaiman's American Gods. As of 2022, he's writing and directing a film version of the Stephen King novel, Christine. A lot of his stuff references pop culture, known for some subversive flair. I could care less about Stephen King and Christine. However, if Brian Fuller is going to do it, I'm going to at least check it out. Okay. We watched the pilot episode of Dead Like Me, which is a solid 70-minute affair. Let's not hold back, as is usually the case on this show. Stacy, it didn't really work for you, huh? Definitely not. Was it back when we were in college? You actually had me, like, preview the show, too? And it was the pilot? I think I only watched, like, the first ten minutes, though. I was singing its graces even back then, but I don't recall you actually sitting down and watching it with me. Yeah, I remember, like, getting a preview. I didn't watch a full episode until today, man. And if you had it your way, we would have never done it. <laughs> yeah, I would never watched it. <laughs> I never would have finished it, honestly. Oh, boy. Yet again. We'll get into more of your negative thoughts a little later. The premise of Dead Like Me, it takes place in 2002, following our main character, Georgia Lass, a sardonic 18-year-old who sticks to the sidelines in life. One day, she's working a crappy temp job, and she gets killed by a flaming toilet seat that came off of the space station mirror as it was falling out of orbit. So quite a notable fiery death. But that's not actually the end for her, of course. Turns out there is an afterlife. Not only is she still sticking around, but she's also joining this group of what are essentially Grim Reapers. In this pilot, she has to learn the ropes how they help souls along, specifically involving external influences, violent deaths, suicides. And she comes into her own a little bit in that she really wasn't a participant in life. But now that she's undead, she has to face some responsibility and grow as a person. Getting into the characters a little bit, who are some of your favorites, or who didn't you really dig? It's hard to say in that first episode. Because you really only get Georgia, you only get her, really, and then you get her transition, and you're met with, like, her new crew. I feel like the first 20 minutes is, like, drug out to me. Felt a little too long for what it was. Is it a coincidence that that's the part where she's still alive? Uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it might be, it might be. You do enjoy your sci-fi fantasy. Maybe that's what felt slow to you at the beginning. <laughs> it could be, because when I finally found the show, I found it on Amazon Prime, and the suggestions that went with it got me super hyped. It's just stuff like Defiance, Far Escape, Battlestar Galactica, Eureka. You know, it had some good recommendations to go with it. Uh, yeah, I don't really see the correlation between this show and those. Yeah, yeah, see? <laughs> Maybe Eureka, just a hair of a similarity, being kind of quirky, but the other stuff, no way. Yeah. Well, it feels like already that I am going to have to champion the show. <laughs> you definitely have to. <laughs> That's all right. I really do like Georgia, except for the CD player and headphones that she's sporting. It wasn't it uh, MP3s then, dude? Like, MP3 came out then, right? Like, that was what everybody was rocking. They were out, but I'm sure they were expensive. I know in 2002, I still had a CD player. Really? I know I had an MP3, man. But I also didn't graduate until 07. It's before iPods, for sure. 
Yeah, way before iPod. But Georgia, she's acerbic, cynical. She feels like she could be a contemporary character, unfortunately. (laughs) Definitely. She has a really cool line. She says, Experience has taught me that interest begets expectation, and expectation begets disappointment. So the key to avoiding disappointment is to avoid interest. (laughs) I do remember that. Okay, I'll give you that. That was one good thing about the show. Oh, ooh, one good thing. Wow. I hope Mr. Fuller's listening to you right now say that. (laughs) His labor of love and you found one good thing. Uh, Well, technically, you found it, sir, you know. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I glossed over it. You did your part by acknowledging its brilliance. (laughs) (laughs) Because honestly, I sat down and watched it with the fiancé, and she's seen it before, back when she was in high school. So I kind of like had her to talk to a little bit. I know some of your viewing habits, and I wonder if maybe you didn't appreciate this as much as you should have, because the dog was hanging all over you, (laughs) you were stopping and starting the movie to go check your email or something. (laughs) Did you really give it your full attention? I definitely did. But, since I had to watch it on Amazon Prime, I did have a couple ads in between commercials. Hey, man, that just makes it a more authentic experience to 2002. True. Although, this show premiered on Showtime, so they didn't have ads. (laughs) Stuart Copeland, former drummer for the police, he said that the production gave him the note that they wanted the music to be happy-sad. Do you think the show pulls off the balance between comedy and drama? No, but that explains a lot. A happy set. I guess if you watch more, you get it a little better. Uh, sure, you got more time with it, but whenever people say, oh, it gets better three, four episodes in, you just got to give it more time. It's like, no, 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 no. (laughs) I need you to show me the goods in the first episode. (laughs) If you haven't properly communicated to me what you're about, and if I'm not into it, There is zero reason for me to watch episode two, three. Some people say, oh, you got to watch the whole season to fully appreciate it. It's like, screw that. I don't know, because I didn't like it. But like at the end, after the pilot was finished, I think, you know what? I could go for episode two right now. Parks had nothing to do. Bored, sitting at home. Just wanted to watch something. Could have went for it. I think the sillier characters, you know, you expect them to bring the comedy. Like that ne'er do well Reaper co worker, Mason, this British dude who comes off a little scummy, but he's also funny. Contrast that with the serious characters, or maybe the one serious character. Do you know who I'm thinking of? Pretty much the one linchpin for the drama in this episode. I know she's a Reaper. I just don't remember her name. Was it like, was her name Ruby? Something like that? Oh, Roxy. Tough as nails. The meter maid. Yeah. Yeah, if I had that job, I'd probably be scowling a lot, too. Gotta be. She's out there busting her hump all day long. Does it remind you of your job? A little too much, yeah. And then she's got to deal with the dead people? Ugh. (laughs) Horrible. As far as dramatic characters, I was thinking of George's mother, Joy, who is a bit of a stick in the mud. Her character... If you took her out of it, and the fact that we see the ramifications of Georgia's death on her family, Georgia, she's having an adventure, she's discovering what it means to be undead, and every now and then we go back to Joy, and we see, no, no, family lost their daughter, there's some drama to this, there's one scene where Georgia goes to a yard sale being put on by her folks, then she talks to Joy, her mother not realizing that it's her daughter. It's an oasis in an otherwise goofy comedy story. How did your daughter die? I don't think I want to have this conversation with you. Well, what was she like? She drove me crazy, if you want to know the truth. What? She was stubborn. I think that's only because she was smart. Probably too smart. She figured a lot of things out way before her friends. That's for sure. We never 
never really got along. I don't think I was a very good mother. It just caught me off guard too, because like she went back. She didn't need to go back, but she went back. And then her mom opens her soul up to a random person. Is there an exact time frame when she goes back or anything like that? Or I want to say within a week of her death. Pretty short turnaround from when she dies to the end of the episode. They do mention the timetable, but it is hard to follow. What do you think of the storytelling tricks and tools in this show? Do you think it's too quirky? Is it too much, or does it not have enough? It's actually pretty good. It's decent for what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Just quirky enough, but not over the top. It's more subtle. Everything flies under the radar on this show to me. You gotta be really paying attention to catch a lot of it. You got one of the good scenes I actually enjoyed. We get to see her actually go out and witness a death. Learn what to do, how to act. Getting a on-the-job experience. And then Mason, he's telling her, okay, we sit here, we just observe. We do nothing. And to pass the time, they kind of play like a little game. Oh my god, who's it going to be? How are they going to die? Like, how's all this going down? You're talking about the bank scene, right? Yeah. Because they do a lot of myth building in this first episode, explaining the rules of being undead and kind of explaining what their job is, but then there's also still a lot to be discovered. And one of the details is you get a post-it note with a name and a time of death and an address. That's it. And the rest of the series really takes advantage of that lack of information where you might have mistaken identity, showing up at the wrong place at the right time. Oh, damn. And deconstructing it for themselves as they're waiting, like in this episode. You know, do you think it's the bank teller? Because they don't even say if it's a man or a woman, they just have a first initial and last name. As the fly up on the wall, observe, do not interact. That's very sad of you. You must smoke pot. Seriously. Some reapers believe that your appointment with death is on the books before you're even born. Don't turn up and start moving shit around and talking to people because you, you might change the outcome of events. I think that's like one of the standout scenes. It's very frenetic. There's like four or five little mini stories going on in that scene. A lot happens in, what, like 10 minutes? It played out nothing how you'd expect it to. I don't want to ruin it, because it's such a good scene. There's got to be a theme of randomness in this show. Just considering the crazy way Georgia dies, being hit by a piece of a space station coming down from the sky in a fiery ball. Toilet seat girl. <laughs> Which, unless you know specifically what that's in reference to, it's kind of gross. It could mean a few different things, you know? <laughs> <laughs> when you put it that way, yes. Yes. Poor toilet seat girl. Something I gotta say about the way they tell the story. The shots of the Reapers, when they're just randomly on top of buildings, like it's some Christopher Nolan Batman movie, it's pretty freaking jarring. How did they get up like 20 stories onto the very tippy top of this building. Yeah, that threw me off. Actually, the very first episode of the intro with the lady on top of the building dancing, that threw me off, man. Yeah, it felt like a perfume commercial, didn't it? Yeah, like just a random placement. Okay, look at this. She's in a nice dress and her clothes are just kind of flowing in the Seattle wind and her long hair is whooshing. What is this? What am I watching? <laughs> What's this have to do with death? That's the thing, though, like, after watching the pilot, and then I actually saw the intro for episode two, because I didn't turn it off in time, everything started flowing together and making sense, man. You know, it's like, oh, okay, I see why, I see. I think that was just a bit of flair that they used in the first episode or two. I don't think they keep doing that, because at a certain point, you got to explain how they can just randomly teleport to places. <laughs> And there's some other shots in this pilot that just imply that they have that secret teleportation power. <laughs> it becomes more magical than real in the magical realism of the show. And I think with the subject matter and how quirky it is, you gotta rein it in where you can. 
You don't just have them randomly popping up in weird places for no explicable reason. Was it the family stuff you liked more, or more of the stuff with the team leader, Rube, once she's undead? Definitely more with Rube when she's undead. With Sally's at the end of the episode. I prefer a sitcom with her and Rube. Just their banter. They're both assholes. You get the feeling that he could be her dad. I don't think I'm supposed to be doing this. Oh, if somebody else were supposed to be doing this, I'd be sitting here talking to somebody else. But I don't know anything about anything. You think I do? Most of the time I'm talking out of my ass. Oh, yeah. That's probably the heart of the show is that relationship. And she doesn't always toe the line like a character such as Roxy. The meter maid does feel like she's the top lieutenant whipping the other Reapers into shape when they get out of line. Toward the end of the episode, after Georgia has been shown the ropes, given the Reaper orientation, Rube sends her onto a train that is going to crash, and she's tasked with taking the soul of a little girl. You were surprised that Georgia actually went through with it. I see what you mean, because the first couple acts, Georgia is so obstinate, she doesn't want to participate, and then all of a sudden, by the end of it, she's willing to reap a child's soul. Being dead, she gains a soul, man. <laughs> like, she gains some kind of heart. Because like you said at the beginning, she's all, no expectations, no trying. And now she tries. The way I interpreted it, she cared more and got probably the most emotional you see her, except for immediately after she was blown up. She cared about the girl because she was projecting her situation onto this kid. They're young, the world is screwing them over, they really haven't had a chance to do anything, and then it's all going to be taken away. She's just a little girl. She can't die, it's cruel. It is cruel. It's cruel she'll never know what life is really like. It's cruel she'll miss out on so much love and pain and beauty. And that's sad for everyone in the world except for her. She won't give a rat's ass. She'll be doing something different. That's just the way it is. I felt that, but at the same time, I didn't like it. I didn't like that. Because in the end, the kid got the better of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> So we've been tap dancing around it. Now here's the part where I want you to just delve in deep into the criticisms of this thing. Why didn't you respond to it? From the get-go, man, my expectations were too high. And when I got what I got, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> I was let down. I don't know, I think there was too much explaining at points. Explaining of the rules? Not the rules, just more of like, what's going on, what's happening. Why this is happening when it should have just gave me everything? Because honestly, I feel like that probably, probably could have been like 40 minutes and I would have been satisfied. Like in the beginning, we don't need the part that she's looking for a job or she's becoming a temp. I don't care about that. It could have started off with her getting hit in the head with a toilet seat and I'd be like, oh my God, what just happened? Would have hooked me in instantly. Okay, folks, you're hearing it here. This is the defining moment of this episode. <laughs> And why Stacy didn't like it, and why I love it. <laughs> For me, you can't have enough character stuff. Obviously, it needs to be interesting, and I can understand that her archetype wasn't very interesting for you. But I identified with that character, and in the context of the greater series, it's the only time we see her alive outside of some flashbacks later on. So to establish the relationship with her family, not having a good relationship with her sister, ignoring her. I don't like to be just told what their situation is and to get immediately into the fun stuff, which is probably why you like anime so much. A lot of that stuff, they don't waste any time. I see what you're saying, but they could have brought that back. Like, they usually do a different show, like, bring the past back later on. Like, when she goes to hit the, uh... Yard sale. Couldn't do like a brief flashback. 
or something like that. Just work it in. Not just give me the long story that I didn't want or need. Because <laughs> right now you want to capture me. You want me to be hooked on the show and love it. And it took like 20 minutes to do it. Okay. But besides that, like after we got through that and we started meeting other Grim Reapers, meeting more main characters, then it starts getting interesting. So it does show some promise for the future. Yeah, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> On my end, a lot of the licensed music, the choices feel on-the-nose and unoriginal. In the bank scene, they start playing music. The lyrics are literally talking about the afterlife. And that just gets a little over the top for me. I get it. The show is already telling me about death and these undead characters. You don't need the music to be that, too. It's like if they trotted her out at the end of the episode, after she's a bit more comfortable with being undead, and she's got a bunch of skulls on her t-shirt. <laughs> I hate to just criticize this show. I want to put more positivity into it, because I do enjoy it. Going back to Roxy for a second when they're getting their post-it note assignments and Roxy looks at the note and the name on it and she says I already did this guy I was senior this is uh, junior oh that's sad I should have died together saved you a journey really though <laughs> <laughs> would you say the dialogue in this definitely well thought out if you're not catching it, you're not paying attention. It's like you got to look at the structure of the scene and find the humor from that. Like it's not overtly telling you jokes, which I'm a subtle guy. I like that stuff. I enjoyed that too. That was good. Now swinging back to criticism. I love Georgia. The actress, Ellen Muth, she's great. But I wonder... Now go with me for a second. They make a remake of the show. Maybe they even use the same actress. Oh. A decade or more after. A remake, really? Yeah. Could be cool, but think about this. In the show, she's 18 when she dies. Imagine a version of the story where the character is 30 or 40 years old. Somebody who has life experience and has opinions. Instead of being like the blank slate that Georgia is, because everybody around her, they just come off as more interesting than her. Yeah. Like, if there's a show about uh, Roxy, I'd probably enjoy that more, honestly. <laughs> Sad but true, you know? There are some strong Roxy moments, and they slowly dole out how each of the other Reapers died and when they died, so you realize how old some of these characters are. Oh, what? The way that Roxy is a hard ass, once you find out how she died it makes more sense why she's a bit surly. Now, I'm going to do something that's unique for this episode. I'm actually going to recount a couple of stories where I actually got to interact with Brian Fuller, the creator of the show. What? Yes, indeed. The first time was in 2014. I was living in L.A. I like to write stuff. Scripts novels and he was doing a writer's panel a q a for the premiere of the second season of hannibal they actually recorded it as a podcast so it's out there somewhere still i think i was the first one maybe or second one to ask him a question really nice guy he took my question seriously it was just a wonderful experience and one of the things that I cherish from my time living out there on the West Coast. Glorious West Coast? Eh. If it was that glorious, I'd still be living there. <laughs> <laughs> and so would you, Stacy. <laughs> hey, man, prices drive me out. That one was part of an event. Not too crazy to say, oh, I was there and he was there. No kidding, you got an autograph at a signing. But this time, in 2019... I wasn't expecting to see him at all. I was at a screening at the Egyptian Theater in L.A. for the movie Jojo Rabbit. 
which Brian Fuller had nothing to do with. I'm pretty sure he was just there as a fan. I'm in the lobby before the show. Who do I see? He's a tall man. It's Brian Fuller. Well-dressed as ever. I'd really like to say something, but what do I say? And then I decide, nah, nah, I'm not going to approach him. So then I go to the bathroom. Who comes in behind me a few seconds later? It's Brian Fuller again. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You, you know what I'm about to say here. <laughs> I know where mine is going, sir. And like a weirdo, in my personal monologue, I'm talking to myself going, Is a higher power telling you that you should say something? <laughs> and then reason is flooding my head and I'm going, Ah, no, I've heard plenty of celebrities talk about awkward stories in the bathroom, especially... If you're going to talk to him, at least wait until you're both out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and then I ultimately didn't say anything to him, because I realized being able to talk to him about writing, which is what I did for, you know, just a minute back at that panel he was at, that's really what I would want. And it just wasn't the time or place for that. And ultimately, it's not the sort of fan experience or personal interaction I wanted, so why why try to compress that into just going nuts over the guy and probably making him feel uncomfortable before the movie starts going like, hey, Mr. Fuller, I love you, man. I love all the stuff you do. <laughs> you want to be best friends forever? <laughs> you should have, though, and you might as well at that point, you know? He seems like a guy that, in his fan interactions, he's very gracious, but I've seen other celebrities close up that they're very nice about it, but you can tell they're uncomfortable. And and yeah, just I knew I wasn't going to get the interaction I really wanted with him. It's just the circumstances of things. So I didn't approach him. And then we go to actually watch the movie, and who's sitting a couple rows in front of me? <laughs> Brian Fuller again. <laughs> While I didn't actually talk to the guy, I did, on some crazy level, get to feel like, hey, you know, we're watching this movie together. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my pal, Mr. Fuller, who doesn't even realize I'm here, <laughs> looking at the back of his head every now and then, going like, aha, that was a funny moment. Did you think it was funny, Brian? And realizing he's laughing too. Yeah, we have a similar sense of humor. <laughs> oh if this ever somehow gets back to Brian Fuller, uh, you're a great guy, and please don't think I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it does, man. That'd be nice. Do an episode with them. If there's ever a third opportunity to talk to you, please forget that I even said anything on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Watch it, sir. I need you to love it, enjoy it. Tell us about it when you come on the show. <laughs> Well, let's wrap up this episode with everybody's favorite segment, TLDL, Too Long Didn't Listen. I'm going to ask you some rapid-fire questions. I want you to give me quick answers. Are you ready, sir? I'm ready. What do you think is the episode's strongest quality? The subtle jokes. What do you think is its weakest quality? Everything else. <laughs> wow, you scumbag. <laughs> if I have a third encounter with him, I almost want to just wish it onto you. So that way you can feel like an asshole when he shakes your hand and goes, Hey, nice to meet you. And then you get diarrhea of the mouth and you go, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Fuller, I hated dead like me. <laughs> Okay, as far as general charm, do you think the main character, Georgia, is a successful focus for the show? No. Not for me. Because I really would rather see one of the other Reapers as, like, the main, main character, their perspective. I think they'd be more entertaining for me. Now, this pilot is roughly 70 minutes long. Too long. Let me ask the question first, damn it. <laughs> Do you think it used its time well, or could, should it have been a standard 40 minutes? 
should have been a standard 40 minutes. We work this episode. Bring it back to me. Compared to other show pilots you've watched on the Screen Companion, I want you to rank these from best to worst. Dead Like Me, Smallville, Doom Patrol, and The Expanse. I'm trying to remember The Expanse, just the pilot, just the pilot. Uh, it's hard. It's a hard pick for number one between Doom Patrol and The Expanse. But after that, Smallville, and then Dead Like Me. Yeah, I knew you were going to put Dead Like Me last, which is why I wanted to say it first. (laughs) Okay, you're team leader for a group of Reapers. Where do you meet daily to hand out your assignments? Domino's, Panda Express, Chipotle, or Wendy's? Mmm. See, I love Chinese, man. It's got to be Panda Express. And if I felt like spicy, we switch it up, go Wendy's. I'd follow you there. Okay, you can be my team leader. Because <laughs> <laughs> in the show, they go to a diner called the Waffle House. Yeah. No, thank you. Well, here we are, Stacy. We made it to the end of the episode. The time for any final words you might have. An apology to throw Brian Fuller's way? None whatsoever. Not a single one. (laughs) You remorseless fool. (laughs) (laughs) We have plenty more episodes to do in the future. If you ever want to make a retraction... (laughs) (laughs) 